Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day, subscribe and click the bell. It was very cold and damp in the basement. Jack tried to warm himself with his hands, but it didn't help much. The floor was concrete, and from that icy he could no longer feel his feet. It was as if they had turned to stone. The poor man tried to cover them at least a little with his pathetic. There was about an hour left before he was released. The boy didn't have a watch, but he knew when the janitor Uncle David went to work. And now, by the sounds of it, he was shoveling snow outside. In an hour he would go to the cook's house to ask for breakfast. Jack often stayed in this basement for his misbehavior. The caretaker would put him down here, even for the even candy in the cafeteria. He didn't like the boy. The one allowed himself too much, restricted in lessons, did not go to bed. When necessary, he stole leftover dinner food from the kitchen. This orphanage had the same rules as all the others. You behave well, you get praise and maybe a proper dinner. If you behave badly, you sit in the basement all day. The counselor always said you can beat the shit out of anybody. You just have to find a more subtle way. For him, that way was the cold cellar. He especially didn't want to be here in winter. After all, if in summer in the heat you were put in such a cool room, it's the grace of God. But in winter one could die here not from boredom, as in summer, but from banal cold. Even the first floor is heated very poorly. Children walked around sick, as these constant draughts sold the room. Some fell seriously ill. A couple of times it even came to a fatal outcome. But if you're lucky like Jack, you're unlikely to die even in the worst place on this earth, like this stinking basement. Jack even developed his own method of maturation. Though of course, he peeked at this method in a book called Cold. Friction would do the trick. That's how limbs got started. Not a problem. Fall on them with warm air from your mouth. But if these methods don't work, just jump every now and then and wait for your punishment to end. What was Jack doing? The boy often withdrew into his thoughts, to help his body at least a little to distract himself from all sorts of problems, hypothermia, heat, and even the pain of the shots. Jack disliked them very much. The doctor here did them horribly, harshly, and cruelly. So at times like this, he would just start dreaming. He's got a big two-story house in the center of town. He is sipping his favorite hot coffee, sitting by the fireplace and reading a book. Next to him sits his faithful friend Domet and guards his master. Of course, all these dreams were not unfounded. When Jack became sad, he often took out his favorite book. And though he didn't have a fireplace or hot coffee, he did have a Domet, the yard dog that fate had brought him together with a year ago. Jack had escaped from the shelter again that day. He often did that when he got too bored or wanted to seek adventure in one place. And sometimes he just wanted freedom. Of course, this did not exempt him from responsibility, and he was still returned and very punished. Sometimes it even came to corporal punishment, but the boy lived the principle. It will happen not now, but later, and he ran away anyway. Last winter, in December, it was also cold. Jack waited for a moment when the tutor would leave for a couple of minutes, and carefully went downstairs, where the windows opened, made a mess, might and slipped away, of course, the hole in the fence had been made in advance and not even by him, but by past generations. But it was still used by the caretakers. It was often delayed. However, the boys here lived righteous, and many still managed to escape. Once free, he strode through the dark streets, keeping his hands in his pockets so they wouldn't free so quickly. His plan, as always, was as follows. He escapes, rummages through the garbage for food or anything of value, and comes back when he's cold, or he'd find a place to spend the night, and this time was no exception. However, he was very unlucky that day. All the garbage cans were empty, and if anything was found, it was only food wrappers. And so a desperate Jack wandered back to his cage, where he would be locked in the basement. For at least a whole day, suddenly, a puppy ran out onto the sidewalk, he was covered in some kind of sticky pink mixture and didn't care what was happening to his fur. The doggy looked very tired though. He could barely move his legs. When Jack approached him, the puppy was very surprised and even lively. He looked at the passerby with interest. 
and the boy, in turn, examined the mongrels. That pink mishmash on his fur was like icing. It was very strange. However, when the kid turned his head to the left, he saw the word bakery. And near this building was a small courtyard where the garbage cans stood. That's where the dog's pink footprints led. Jack approached the dumpster and his hunch was confirmed. The confectioner didn't seem to like the icing, so he poured it right into the dumpster where the puppy had ended up. Stupid. With a smile, the boy asked the doggy, who was now following him. Jack examined the puppy and realized that in winter, the mutt would not find a place to wash. And he didn't seem to care much about it either. So the boy decided to take him with him. Yes, he did not nourish the hope that the educator would allow this creature to stay in the shelter. However, in this institution, the boy also had friends among the staff. One of them was Uncle David. Jack had known him all his life. He was in the orphanage all his conscious life, and this good man helped him in everything with lessons, often defended him from educators, and gave him useful life advice. Yes, Jack was a child to you. He always needed some kind of movement. That's why the staff really disliked him. He was too much trouble. But Uncle David saw something special in that boy. He was just a kid. He told the others, let him have his fun. Of course, that attitude made Jack realize who in this world to trust and who not to trust. Uncle David never left a boy in trouble, so he was very helpful that day as well. Uncle David whispered to the 13-year-old boy, help me, please. The man at that moment was also shoveling snow in the backyard of the orphanage. This year's snowfalls were endless, and these rubble piles had to be shoveled every single day when he turned around. There was surprise in his gaze. Jack, what are you doing here? The counselor already put you down. Well, and you got you kid with the strictness. However, and with sympathy, said David. Of course a man. Yes, and all the staff of the orphanage are already used to the antics of this boy. But every time the boy went back, he caught Uncle Jack's disappointed look. Tom always felt very sorry for the boy. He had warned him many times about the consequences of such outings, but Jack never listened to him. Jack looked at the man with innocent childlike eyes. Then he stepped aside. Behind him was a puppy that sat meekly in the snow and even seemed to be smiling. And who is this? Asked Uncle David, squatting down to study this little creature whose body was almost entirely in a pink gooey glaze. The one that got it from the magical candy world. The man joked. I found him by the bakery. Uncle David, he's all dirty. Please help me clean him up. The man stood up and gave the boy a stern look. You see him now where I found him. Please, he's all sticky. Where will he find at least a horror? It's winter, he's very small. David continued to hold a stern look, but after a moment he gave in and gave in to Jack's pleas. He sighed heavily, but decided to help the poor thing. Okay, I'll help your horrible friend, but promise me that he won't run away from the orphanage again. The boy thought briefly and nodded vigorously. Of course, he didn't even plan to fulfill his promise. And Uncle David guessed about it. So this is where you are not a tolerable boy. The voice of the tutor came from behind. Jack looked fearfully at Uncle David, who also hid the puppy behind the shovel. Jack slowly turned around at the shrieks of his tormentor. The tutor abruptly grabbed the boy's arm and began to reprimand him. And where have you been half the day has been? I hope you had a good walk, because now you won't leave the cellar for two days. Benjamin, it's my fault. I thought it would do him good to help me shovel snow. And I'm bad. My head didn't notice how the time flew by. Started making excuses for David. He and Jack looked at each other, and David continued, please don't punish him. It's my fault. The teacher looked at Jack menacingly. He didn't look dirty. His clothes were whole and clean. Usually the kid came in a complete tatters and always had to be given new pants and shirt. And now the mentor seemed to believe Uncle David. What are you depriving yourself of dinner since you didn't ask for it? Without taking his eyes off the boy, he began. And you? The man turned to David. From now on, keep track of the time and warn me. Otherwise you will have to talk to the principal. I understand, Benjamin. Uncle David obediently replied. The teacher looked questioningly at Jack, as if he expected him to say something. I hear you, Benjamin, Jack repeated, 
winking at David. Outrageous. The teacher was indignant and led the boy into the building. David was left alone. Behind him, the puppy sat quietly behind the shovel. But a fluffy donut would glaze. Let's go swimming, said the man, took the dog in his arms and carried it in his hand. How's the donut? Asked Jack, entering the janitor's modest room the next day. It was on the first floor, and the entrance was from the backyard. Although the room was small, it fit a lot of things. One bedroom, a bed, an old desk, and even a TV and refrigerator. Very often the room reminded him of Harry Potter's den, where he had lived until his 12th birthday. Jack often joked that Uncle David was the grown-up Harry Potter. And he replied that he looked more like X, yes, because he was quite large in build. But there was one thing that made the man different from Harry. He had his own bathroom, a room. It was a shower stall a few centimeters from the front door. Uncle David was sitting on the bed with him next to him. Satisfied, fed, and clean-eared, buddy. Donut asked the janitor in surprise. Well, yes, his name is Donut now. Or do you know anyone else who could have gotten just as ridiculously stuck in the baking icing bin? Uncle David grinned and motioned for the boy to sit next to him. He nodded affirmatively and ate up the tension by the bed. The puppy immediately ran over to the boy's lap and curled up. Uncle David, what will happen now? Jack said sadly. What do you mean? From the donuts? He won't be allowed to live with us. You won't be allowed. David said seriously. They don't care about me. The boy's eyes lit up with joy. He turned to the man and hugged him. Uncle David, are you the best? Whispered the happy child. The janitor patted him on the back. You realize what you have now done for this poor boy? A real gift. A terrible and sad memory of his little daughter, who died of cancer a few years ago, immediately came over him. David came home one day with a puppy. It was his daughter's birthday and she was excited about the gift, just as Jack was now. That was probably why Uncle David had grown so fond of the little boy. He was just as fidgety and just like his Lisa. I'm David, it's okay, Jack asked, noticing the obviously sad expression on his older friend's face. And I'm just awfully glad you found a new friend. And now, sitting in the basement, the boy remembered it all with a smile. Last year at Christmas, everyone had candy and new stationery. And only Jack had a donut that no one knew about. He spent all his free time with it every morning and every evening he would go off to Uncle Jack's den and play with his new horrible friend there. There was the sound of the lock opening to the basement doors. Come out, the stern voice of the tutor sounded. The boy got up from the cold floor and walked to the stairs. What are you staring at? Come up, I'll show you where to clean. The tutor commanded. Jack could barely move his legs. They were like convicts, fixing a cellar confinement wasn't the only punishment. After that, half the orphanage had to be scrubbed to a mirror shine. As soon as the boy came out of the cellar, they gave him a mop and a red bucket. Today, in my opinion, the first, second floor, and do not forget about the dust, announced the tutor. But Benjamin, I just went to bed two hours later than I should. Why am I being punished so cruelly? I'm terribly tired. My legs were mending at Jack's school like a little puppy. But he was rudely interrupted. So cruelly grinned the mentor. You are not deprived of reading books, TV and other entertainment. You're just being asked to clean up. Or do you want more responsibilities? Tired. And you weren't tired yesterday. No sorry, the boy lowered his head in embarrassment. Benjamin patted him on the shoulder and walked away, leaving Jack alone in the huge hallway. This orphanage wasn't much different from the others. But there were some important differences. The electricity here was often turned off to save money. The food was of very questionable quality, and the staff was not known for their friendliness. And while many other orphanages had Christmas parties and gifts from charitable foundations, and for some reason, their institutions were bypassed. The rich donors didn't like the owner of the institution. They just called her a viper. And indeed, her terrible character was associated exactly with this creeping creature. And she herself was skinny, as simple, all the time angry and irritated on employees and subordinates, and talked to everyone as if personally to her every interlocutor for life owed. No wonder that all charitable companies shunned her. 
once she literally threw out one of the volunteers, because to organize holidays for children required huge expenses, in her opinion. Of course, this was followed by lawsuits and administrative investigations. But the case was quickly hushed up. According to rumors, the principal just knew who and when to give a paw, and everywhere had her interceptions. Called this snake, and such a principal Catherine. Of course, she was also cruel to children. And this woman certainly did not like children and as soon as possible would like to get rid of them. Once a couple adopted a boy from their orphanage. But after a month they gave him back, citing that he was a very naughty and capricious child. It turned out that throughout that month the poor boy was bullied, starved, beaten and humiliated in every possible way. And now even life in this orphanage seemed like a fairy tale to him. Compared to life at his new mom and dad's, the principal gritted her teeth and took the child back. For her, it was another extra year, extra costs and expenses, nothing more. What about herself? She was not poor, earning her loot, stealing from poor orphans. Jack had skipped breakfast, however had washed all the plates and tables. The entire dining room was clean, so was the entire first floor. Now that left the second, which Uncle David had volunteered to help him with. It's all cleaned up. Now run throw out the trash and run to lunch. The man ordered glumly. Jack nodded and was about to run to fulfill the request. However, the uncle stopped and turned around. Are you all right? Asked the boy. Yes, everything is fine. Let's get to work. The boy was a little more cheerful, replied David. Jack didn't insist, but David was clearly in trouble. He was rarely this depressed. But today he was sluggish, which didn't please the boy, already closing the trash can. Jack saw a girl walking behind the fence. She was carrying in her hand some kind of box in red beautiful wrappings. It immediately caught his eye, as Jack was very fond of the color red. He went closer to the fence and called the girl. She approached the boy with disbelief. What's that in your box? Jack asked. I bought a present for my mom for Christmas. Proudly answered the girl, and the boy made a detached sound. So, will you give it to her? Is it a secret? The stranger giggled. Jack smiled at her, and she walked on. And suddenly he felt so sad and empty. After all, he had no father or mother. He never received gifts and never gave them to anyone. Jack had never felt such a pleasant emotion in his life when someone gives you something. The only really nice gift in his life was when Uncle David decided to take care of the donuts. And that's when he realized that David was the most precious person to him. The one who replaced both his father and a kind grandfather and a good teacher. All the best qualities of a good family man were gathered in this man. It's a pity he didn't have a family. His wife died immediately after childbirth, and his daughter died of cancer a few years later. For the rest of his life he lived in that little room helped the orphanage and got along very well with the children. But of course, the most special child to him remained Jack. They met when the kid was only seven years old. It was raining that day, and the kids brought a lot of mud from the street. Little Jack was sent to get the janitor to clean the floors. But it was David's day off that day, so he was resting in his room and reading a book. Jack knocked timidly on the door. Who else has come? A menacing, disgruntled voice answered. The boy was even frightened. He was shy and always fearful of adults. But he still had to go in the damn thing. Otherwise he would be scolded severely for not running an errand. I'm sorry, quipped Jack quietly. Not sorry, detachedly, muttered the janitor. I was told you needed to be called in to clean up. It's my day off today, I won't be doing anything. You tell your tutor that. But I was really asked. I don't care if you were asked. I don't get paid for this. Now get out of here. The man shouted at the boy and slammed the door with force. The boy stood there with his nose pressed against the closed shabby door. Fear appeared in his eyes. What would the tutor say to him? But it's not his problem, right? It's the janitor's job, not his. It's not his fault. But as it turns out, that's not the law in this orphanage. What? What did he say to you? arrogantly questioned Jack Mentor that it was his day off, and you should have just told him I ordered it. Why do I have to do everything myself? You were asked to simply relay the order. What's so hard about that? The man exploded. 
but he said that means now you go and clean up all the cold dirt. Got it, shouted the tutor and then grabbed the boy's arm. The boy was about to cry, but what was his fault? Let the boy go. Suddenly a rough male voice was heard from behind. Jack turned around and saw the janitor. Oh, here comes the liberator. The caretaker remarked sarcastically. Don't touch the boy, he's not guilty of anything. I'll clean it up now, David said sternly. Benjamin looked haughtily at the boy and at the janitor, then silently turned and left. David walked over to the boy and squatted down so that he was the same height as him. I'm sorry, kid. I didn't think you'd be persecuted like that because of me. The boy nodded silently. He didn't know what to say in such situations. A thank you would sound strange and inappropriate. Since you don't want to help out around here, I can buy you ice cream later. Jack's eyes lit up with joy. He very rarely had ice cream. It was only for special occasions. The caretakers at this orphanage gave such a treat. Unless it was Christmas, birthdays, and the orphanage never celebrated these kids at all. You're all like stray dogs and stray dogs don't have birthdays, said the caretakers contemptuously. Anyway, Jack never got ice cream for nothing. So he instantly accepted the janitor's offer. Thus was born their strong male friendship, which has lasted until now. Once Uncle David helped Jack out, and sometimes the boy helped his older comrade. As he returned to the orphanage he heard the signal for dinner. The dining room was quite large, for it was home to about 300 children of various ages. Jack, as usual, sat down next to Maria his new friend. Her parents had died in a car accident a year ago, and now she lived here. The children were in the same group under the same teacher. The kids hit it off right away and became pretty good friends. Maria was a year younger than Jack, but she was very smart, which the boy liked. She was fond of books and spent almost every free minute in the library. This girl was a real Hermione Granger among the residents of the orphanage. Jack, on the other hand, felt like Ron Weasley. He often asked his friend for advice, to which she either sent him away for his stupid ideas or helped him when she thought it was worthwhile. Maria wasn't a nerd and was always up for different adventures, unless of course they entailed the possibility of punishment. She smells awful. Jack mood, poking at the fish with his fork. It's just fish. Eat it, and don't complain. You missed breakfast today anyway, and last night dinner was sitting in your favorite basement. Blaming him. Maybe I was bored. I didn't have anyone to talk to. Well, I'm sorry our kindergarten teacher didn't like me. Is the boy resentful? No, he's doing the right thing. It's your fault for not following the rules that are written for everyone. You went to bed at 12 instead of 9. That's a crime. If you don't think families have rules like that, you're wrong. Kids have to go to bed pretty early, and it affects their physical and psycho-emotional state. And a cold basement where the batteries don't work has no effect. That's the punishment you deserve. What a bore you are, Maria, sighs Jack, rolling her eyes. The girl looked at him with a suspicious squint in her eyes. Jack noticed this stare and said with some surprise, why are you looking like that? You were going to tell me something before lunch. Tell me you decided to snow Benjamin's room. The boy raised his eyebrows and exclaimed indignantly. What? How could you even think such a thing? With your imagination, you can only write books. That's what I read them for, foolishly replied Maria. So, yes, I've been cleaning. Uncle Jack helped today. I've noticed he's been a little off lately. The girl leaned into the boy's ear. What do you mean? Something's happened to him. I can't figure out what it is. We should go see him today to find out what happened. And ah, uh, I had another thought while I was cleaning up. Well, tell me, I'm sick of procrastinating. I want to give Uncle David a Christmas present. The girl sent her eyebrows rising up in surprise. What? She exclaimed. And realizing that it was very loud, immediately covered her mouth with her hand. Maria became uncomfortable with such attention. At this shout, Benjamin came up to them. The boy looked at his friend with condemnation. She only smiled embarrassedly. Why are you shouting? The educator began to swear. I'm sorry. Found out that my favorite character in the book dies at the end. I didn't see that coming. I mean, he was the best. Maria got out of it. Boris gave her a stern look and left silently. 
What kind of hero? Sneezed boy. When the tutor moved a decent distance away, Maria rolled her eyes and with feigned arrogance said interesting. But you don't care about books anyway. Perhaps, mumbled Jack. After some silence the girl first broke the silence. So you want to give something to some Uncle David, but not to me. Indignantly, but with a smile Maria rambled on. That's exactly what the boy snorted. And seriously, what should I get him? Do you have a choice? It's like being given one million pocket money a month. Jack thought about it. Where would he get a present if he had no money at all? Doing it himself isn't an option. It always looks lame. Doing something with his own hands is obviously not his way of earning money. How? Because you're only allowed to work from the age of 16. His face was studying you. And he lowered his head. Hey, what are you worried about, girlfriend? But Jack didn't answer. They started to be kicked out of the cafeteria as lunchtime was up. Now the kids had to get dressed and go outside. After eating, they were all going for a walk with the caretaker. So without finishing their conversation, the friends scattered to their locker rooms, quickly getting ready for their walk. So what do you think? Jack asked suddenly when he finally got close to Maria and paired up with her. They were walking along the usual route. Their path took them across the road. Then they turned left where there was a large park. The children needed fresh air, their kind principal said. The teacher, of course, didn't like the idea of walking these good surfs for an hour every day, no matter what the weather was like. What are you talking about? The girl asked in bewilderment. How can I earn money for a present? Have you decided what you want to give? Uncle David has long dreamed of a new winter coat. His old one is already covered in cardboard. There are holes everywhere, and it doesn't keep warm anymore. Anyway, I don't want him to get sick. A coat like this costs around 200. More or less good, Maria said thoughtfully. 200. Jack whispered in his mind, figuring out how to earn that amount. I don't think you can get that much money in a month. Disappointedly stretched the girl. The boy was silent. His friend was right, it's true. Even with such a great desire he could not get a job, and earn such a sum. The main thing that hindered him was his age. He was not yet 16 and officially could only get a job from that age, and the orphanage did not allow the pupils to work on the side. Jack couldn't think of any other way to get money, and he was very sad about it. He wanted very much to make a present to Uncle David. The man had done a lot for him, and he wanted to return the favor. And it was on this walk that Jack got this crazy idea. Are you crazy? Maria exclaimed. The boys were sitting in the library after lunch, because it was pouring rain outside, and they hadn't been taken for a walk in the park today. I know it sounds crazy and even scary, but it's worth it. Jack reassured her. According to you, every time you escape from the orphanage to start working as a courier to drug houses. That's a good idea. But I didn't say it was a good idea. But why not give it a shot? I still have a year of patience to try to get a job. This way, I'll just start working early and unofficially. Jack, this is reckless, hear me out. You think you're gonna get away with this? You'll work as a courier for a while, but someday you'll be exposed and you won't be able to be away so much as to give Uncle David a present. How do you envision that happening? Actually, if they put you in the basement for going to bed two hours late, what are they going to do if you go missing every single day for a month? The girl said restlessly. Why are you making such a big deal out of it? I've already made up my mind. I'll avoid the quiet hour. He got a job as a courier under the earnings, and by the holidays I will be able to buy Uncle David. A real nice gift. Yeah, I'm prepared to be punished. A lot of punishment. I'm sure I'll get a record and a nasty character reference. But I really want to give the Dan gift. You know what I mean? He deserves it for all the years he's worked here for what he's been through, and I'm willing to do anything. Are you really crazy? I'm upset. Where? Tell me you find your employers. That behind every bush, there is a drug dealer ready to take the orphanage as a drug mule. Jack gave Maria a mocking look. What are you? Or do you think I'm crazy? That's exactly what I think, she said. I've already been given an address by a high school student for a percentage of future sales. My God, is this some kind of mafia drug trafficking ring? Maybe. Well, then you're gonna help keep it going. 
The girl looked at him incredulously. She didn't want to let her only friend go on such a dangerous adventure, and she couldn't risk it herself. It would lead to huge problems. Unlike Jack, she was totally unprepared for them. But his eyes were so bright when he talked about his stunning plan Jack really wanted to make his Uncle David happy. So Maria nodded affirmatively, even though it was a hard choice to make. She was worried about Jack. Anything could have happened to him this month. Up to and including murder. A lonely teenage orphan in a big dangerous city. It didn't occur to her that Jack could do such a thing. It was really dangerous and very dangerous indeed. Then meet here tonight after dinner and discuss the plan going forward. Said Jack as if he had no choice. But let's stop by Uncle David's first. I want to make sure he's okay. The girl nodded silently again. She was both scared and anxious, but she wanted to help her friend. In the evening, as agreed, they met at the library. From there, the boys headed to David's. They knocked on the door, the den. There was no answer. And then Jack looked over at Maria, decided to open the door unceremoniously. Uncle David was lying on the bed with his arms around his head. He looked utterly despondent and completely disillusioned with his life. Uncle David, what happened? Maria asked excitedly, approaching the man. He took his hands off his head and looked at the children sorrowfully. Jack had never seen David cry before. The boy doubted that this strong man could cry at all and could be so unhappy. But suddenly something alarmed Jack. He did not hear the native dog barking. Nowhere was the shaggy doggy who greeted him every time with an enthusiastic bark. Uncle David held out Jack. Where's the donut? David gave another sobbing kick, and that's when Jack realized everything from the donut. Was something wrong? The boy walked over to the janitor and asked again, already more agitated, where's my dog? Jack, this is so awful. I'm such a fool. Please, forgive me, Vanya, make a deal. What happened? Shouted the boy is already out of control, and he was taken by Jack. They decided that dogs don't belong here. They came and took him while I was out. I came back here, he was gone. As I was looking, I wondered how he managed to open the door. Maybe I didn't close it tight enough. Then Benjamin himself came in. He said he'd handed over the viper's dog. And the stale looking man cried again. Maria immediately began to soothe him. And Jack didn't hesitate a moment longer. He ran straight to the principal's office. He didn't care that it was late. All he cared about now was the long-eared innocent creature he had taken into his care and let down. Jack was experiencing such a variety of feelings. Anger, frustration, hurt, despair, God alone. It was known what the principal could do to the little defenseless one. Just the thought of what could happen to him made the boy's hair stand up on his head. Where is my dog? Bursting into the principal's office, Jack shouted in a voice that was not his own and Kate sat in her chair turned to the window. She was watching the sunset. As soon as the boy burst into her office, she slowly turned around. Jack was annoyed by her nonchalant stony expression. Where's my dog? In a voice trembling with anger, the boy asked. You obviously, you mean that vile mongrel, which inexplicably as it turned out to our staff janitor, sarcastically asked the principal, who liked the utmost precision in everything. It's not a mongrel mongrel, and baptized Jack. This is my friend, and once again. In an icy tone said the viper small brown dog with crooked legs, who lived in the gatehouse of the janitor and gave him to the right place. Where, where did you give him to? Snapped the boy out of his seat. Suddenly a heavy hand fell on his shoulder. Jack turned around and saw the tutor. He turned him around, grabbed his arm and led him out of the classroom. Jack screamed and kicked trying to get out of the dead grip, but all was unsuccessful. Why are you yelling? Finally Benjamin couldn't stand it. Your dog had been taken to a shelter. You knew perfectly well that we couldn't have animals. At first we thought it was the janitor's dog. But now that you've broken into the principal office, it's clear. What kind of a fool are you? Bring him back, bring him back. You have no right. And the boy with his screams you're not helping the cause. My dear, tomorrow you'll get the punishment you deserve. Now you're going to bed. Night fell at nine o'clock. All the children had to lie in their beds. Maria and Jack were no exception. They were also pushed in their beds. 
But as soon as the caretaker left, the planned play began. Jack quietly got out of bed, picked up his backpack that was behind his pillow. He often ran away from the orphanage, so he already had a backpack prepared for such an occasion. It contained all the essentials. He tiptoed down the hall to the next room where the girls slept. When he reached the door, he quietly knocked three times at the agreed time. Maria, of course, was also awake. As soon as she heard the conditional signal, quickly got out of bed and slipped out into the corridor. Carefully looking around the sides of the children in short sprints, reached the main recreation leading to the stairs. They peeked out from behind the door and peered down the empty hallway. There was no one on the first floor. The way was clear. Let's run. Maria whispered. The children went down the stairs. Both bent the hallway and almost got caught by the tutor, who had already gone into his room. Now all they had to do was divert the guard's attention. They stopped, breathing heavily. They looked at each other and realized it was time to say goodbye. I hope you'll come back someday, Vanya. I will miss you very much, quietly said the girl. A tear rolled down her cheek. But Jack did not notice it, as it was quite dark. I'll be back confidently, replied the boy. See you later, I promise. We will see you again. With these words he, as it was intended, hid behind a column in the semi-darkness and faintly lit night of the hall. Almost nothing could be seen. The principal had saved every light bulb to cut down and buy things necessary for the orphanage. Maria went straight to the guard post. This night there was an obese old man Robert on duty. What are you doing here? He said threateningly when he saw a thin girlish figure in the semi-darkness. Maria, following the plan, tried to pretend to be sleepwalking, but she was very bad at it, to put it mildly. She just walked with her arms stretched forward like a zombie. After all, that's how they showed it in the movies. But Jack didn't pay any attention to that. And while the guard came out from behind his counter to deal with Maria wandering in the night, he slipped past, bent over, pushed open the heavy door, the electronic lock that hadn't worked in a month. Praise the stingy viper. He finally got free by jumping through a hole in the fence. He quickly made his way out of the orphanage. Okay, I'll ask you again, what are you doing here? The guard asked Maria threateningly, but she did not get out of character. She still didn't make any sense. Walked, stretching her arms forward and half, covering her eyes. Sakharova, suddenly sounded a heavy voice from behind. In this voice, the girl immediately recognized Benjamin. She woke up immediately and turned around, shaking with terror. Why aren't you in bed? Suspiciously asked the tutor. The girl looked at her tutor in horror. She didn't know what she should do now. She had been exposed, which meant Jack would be exposed now. She only hoped that he had already escaped. I started Maria, even though I had no idea what to say, but the tutor did it for her. He grabbed the girl's hands and pulled her behind him. You'll spend tonight in the Tessieu and tomorrow we'll figure out what to do with you. Formidable announced Benjamin, tossing the poor girl into the damp, cold cellar. From who? From whom? But I never expected this from you. Maria. The girl didn't even look at him. She knew no amount of apologizing would help. She'd have to sit here all night. Maria hoped it wasn't all for nothing at least. Jack woke up on a large trash bag, on the maintenance floor of some open entryway, he had stumbled upon a few blocks from the orphanage. It was about 700 and the winter sun was just showing over the horizon. As he stepped out of the entryway and looked around the area he had found himself in last night, the teenager realized he was almost outside the city. Behind the rows of high-rise buildings were already visible impressive private houses. Between these neighborhoods stretched a huge vacant lot where the townspeople who lived nearby walked their children and dogs. There was a frozen pond, on which a spontaneous skating rink was organized, and the natural height differences allowed to organize long snow slides. On weekends, fun was boiling here and both kids and adults were skating on snow pens and sleds. Heating the area, Jack began to think about where he could go to get something to eat. In his pocket was the measly $20 Maria had given him. Will you need this more? He remembered her words. Sighing, he smiled all over his spring face and headed wherever his eyes were. Choosing high-rise neighborhoods, 
he rightly reasoned that there would be more infrastructure here than enclosed cottage settlements. Suddenly, a horrifying scene unfolded before his eyes in the archway that led to the courtyard of the big house. Some hooligans had pinned the poor girl against the wall. Jack didn't hesitate to come closer. Give me the money, you cunt, shouted the rough voices. I already told you I have nothing, answered the poor girl crying. Only the phone, I swear, there's nothing else. Let me go. Jack couldn't stand it any longer and stepped out of the shadows. Get away from her. He ordered in as gruff a tone as possible. The boys turned around. There was a smirk on their faces. One of them had a huge black eye. The other was clutching a knife. It looked pretty intimidating. Oh, and this is not like your boyfriend, grinned one of the big guys, turning to the girl. She was silent with sobs and howls and looked questioningly at Jack. There was genuine consternation in her gaze. I repeat, get away from her, or will you be sick? Jack blurted out, even though he knew there was nothing he could do. He'd never played sports. And of course, he wasn't a jock either. The guys took offense, staggered out of such insolence and began to slowly circle like wolves approaching him. Jack involuntarily began to retreat backward and here he ran into a blank wall. There was nowhere to retreat further. Now he too felt like that unfortunate girl. His body was numb with fear or something. I asked one of the guys mockingly. And at that moment, whether from fright or from the courage that suddenly seized him Jack, kicked his foot in a heavy boot right between the big guy's legs. He rolled off the ground and screamed in pain. Why are you getting the wrong side of the tracks? The other man shouted. Jack ran a couple of meters along the wall, but the guy caught up with him and grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. Run, shouted Jack to the girl who was watching the scene as if in a trance. Then he got a very strong blow on his face, as if he was paralyzed, and he collapsed on the floor. Jack struggled to get up, but eventually passed out. Maria stood in the principal office and waited. She didn't know what was about to happen to her. Early in the morning she had been dragged out of the basement where she had brought here by her limbs. Not yet completely recovered from the terrible cold. She understood Jack very well now. Now the girl was trying to think of an excuse for everything that had happened yesterday. She didn't think they would be exposed so quickly. She hadn't been prepared for Jack to run away at all, and she was all the more certain that she wouldn't be blamed for it. After all, Jack had often escaped from the shelter, and she had never been touched and she had nothing to do with the dog. But now she felt guilty of every mortal sin. Her teeth chattered against her eyes, tears welling up. Sit down, Kate ordered, entering the office. The girl as a robot complied with the instructions on her stony face. No feelings and emotions were reflected. All the experiences were happening inside. The principal sat down in her leather chair and took out some documents and said, Maria, According to the information I received, you were walking around the orphanage yesterday after lights out. How do you explain your actions? I started, Maria at the same time thinking of something to justify myself. I'm sleepwalking. Yes, that's what our guard told me. However, you woke up immediately. As soon as Benjamin saw you. I don't have to make excuses, we all know that. You helped your friend Jack escape and I'm right. Maria even caught her breath they understood. She started to feel nauseous. She'd never been in this kind of trouble before. Jack might be used to it, but she had always been an obedient and intelligent girl, and she couldn't believe that all this was really happening to her. Yes, said Maria in a fallen voice. There was silence in the office. Kate seemed to ponder the situation for ages and finally decided to ask where he was going. I don't know, lied the girl. Then maybe you know why he decided to run away at night. It's obvious. He's got a little spirit. Maria saddled up on her favorite horse. The explanation is that everyone sleeps at night, and he was only discovered missing in the morning. And they didn't think that after what happened last night he wouldn't run away. That's ridiculous. He's always been very emotional. And if you had at least tried to calm him down, it probably wouldn't have happened. Wow. The viper marveled at the audacity of that. Well, in response to your amazing monologue, I am happy to inform you that you and your friend are in big trouble with irony and some incomprehensible to normal people pride, said the principal. 
Maria's heart sank into her heels. What have I done? With despair, she thought. Jack woke up terribly and with pain in his head, he barely opened his eyes and realized that it was already dark. After regaining consciousness a little, he stirred and looked for his backpack. Naturally, it wasn't there. He didn't have to think long. These two guys had his stuff, and there was some money and some clothes. Some food, a penknife the boy treasured. It was all gone in an instant. The boy felt like a helpless puppy in this big city. He got up from his slumber. He tried to wipe the blood from his face with his hand and went wherever he could, wandered through the streets dedicated to bright electric lights. Now the idea of running away seemed to him a complete delusion. He was too young for all this and he shouldn't have left, and to return now was shameful and pointless. No, he's already made his choice. He would find donuts and a job. Jack desperately hoped Maria would be okay, but right now his main concern was his missing backpack. For now he had nothing, and he was getting hungrier by the minute. Jack wandered onward, unable to see where he was going. It took about an hour. When the pain in his stomach became unbearable, he found himself at the fence of a posh cottage community. It was so beautiful here. Well-groomed paths, smart Christmas trees shimmering and themselves running lights flaunted in the center of a large round space cleared of snow. At the very entrance gate, of course, stood a powerful barrier and sat in a booth guard, strictly looking around, all those passing and passing into the territory accountable to him. Jack sighed he is absolutely no use to anyone here in the dwelling of the rich. He is just an abandoned by all and an orphan stranger at this feast of life. But that was not the nature of our hero to feel sorry for himself for long. Smiling, the boy turned left from the main entrance and on the light made nonchalantly her face say, well, and did not really want to, and went to himself in a sprawl. After 50 meters, having made sure that from here the guard could no longer see him from behind the lush, evenly trimmed coniferous hedges framing the high fence, Jack let loose with all his legs along the perimeter. He knew perfectly well that every fortress, even the most impregnable one, was bound to have a weak spot. And so it was. On the back side of the huge rectangle that was the settlement, he saw a chain of dog tracks, pulling them right under the thorny branches. Aha! Uh -huh. Jack rejoiced and bent down into the fragrant business thickets. Of course, you had one iron bar here, rotten from time, and somebody kicked it out. So there was a normal such a hole in the very time to get through a dog or another evil teenager to find himself on the other side. Jack was in no hurry to get out of his key hiding place. He looked around first, scouting the surroundings. The house directly across the street glowed with the bright orange lights of the big windows. A large dog rattled its chain in the yard. The owners clearly lived here all the time. The next ones to his right also showed signs of frequent human presence. And on the other side, also advancing under cover of the hedge, the boy scrutinized the house's opposite. At last one of them seemed to him suitable. Though the main driveway and cleared, but at the door and attacked piles of frozen snow all the windows are dark. Only in the gatehouse at the gate light is on, it means they are clearing the passage for the seldom coming owners. And the door and is used very rarely. That's right. It is much easier for the guard to press the button on the remote control to go outside the perimeter if necessary than to clean the snow at the door. If the rich gentlemen were here all the time, they wouldn't let this happen. Having made such conclusions, Jack resolutely moved forward. But of course he did not go straight ahead. He went around back and also looked for a weak spot in the fence. And here it was found, but another one on the brickwork, the support post. He climbed the fence to decorate the blinds. We are such and easy to slide down the snowy steepness. Of course, the snow from the yard no one takes out a dump truck with mushrooms to the fence, and all matters in the spring itself will melt. Fortunately, this line of houses was the last in the settlement at the very forest. Such plots are always sold more expensive. Everyone likes to live a secluded life. But the only thing that the owners of such houses on the outskirts do not take into account that they will have to spend much more on security. After all, to penetrate the house, unprotected, on the one hand, the presence of neighbors is very easy. 
usually everyone saves on this. And for nothing. When he is in the bathtub rich and will buy himself such a beautiful house, the first thing to plant not one two guards, front and back, and more cameras. Thinking in this way, the boy cautiously walked around the rich mansion, trying to find some crevice to get inside. He was lucky here too. Not counting on success, he pulled the door of the back door, which is usually used by servants. And it easily yielded to the boy, smelled the cozy warmth of a living, well-arranged room. And he did not hesitate long once, and already inside quiet as a mouse. He stood against the wall near the door and listened. There was silence all around. Not a single sound betraying the presence of people. Jack slowly moved forward. He had been in houses like this several times during his escapes. He had broken into other people's dwellings in various ways and knew roughly how things must be organized. Every time it should be noted, he got away with it. I guess he was born under a lucky star, the cheeky boy thought contentedly. But he had never seen such a luxurious house. As he walked through the corridors and hallways, he looked around in utter delight. Marble floors, oak paneling, massive doors and windows, lights, curtains like in a movie about royal life, huge faces, evening furniture, paintings on the walls. Jack realized that he had entered the dwelling of very wealthy people. The boy wanted to find a place to eat and sleep, but there was no place to sleep. There is nowhere to sleep in such luxury, even on the floor the carpets are so clean and fluffy that it seems that one stepped on them and immediately spoiled them. Besides, one could not discount the possibility that the rich tenants could return at any moment. After all, the New Year's holidays were coming up, and the place didn't look abandoned at all. Not even the smallest thing was covered in dust. It proved that the house was well looked after. The three-story huge house required such a constant investment in its maintenance that the mother would not grieve. On the first floor were various household rooms, from where Jack and penetrated into the front rooms. Then a giant hallway lined with marble mosaics, a huge living room with a fireplace, some other rooms, kitchens, a master suite with a bar, more like a mausoleum. Here Jack found some food items. It was mostly well-packaged or canned food, juices. And there was isolated water, all of which could not have pleased the hungry boy, and he ate well and took enough with him in a bag found here in one of the drawers. On the second floor were the bedrooms of many, many bedrooms. Too many, in fact. And of course, Jack entered a couple of them. He didn't hesitate to take a warm blanket from some bed. How many of them is there? He was in for another cold night, maybe more than one. He didn't touch anything of value. He knew perfectly well that the loss of canned food and play would not upset anyone. But if he reported gold, expensive appliances or silverware, or any other valuable trinkets, then he will definitely be found. The police do their best for such rich people. When he was about to leave, he saw the nightstand, which had not been closed all the way, and in it an elegant jewelry box. When he opened it fully, he gasped. There was a great array of beautiful jewelry, a real treasure trove, the glitter of precious stones, mesmerized the teenager, and he, nevertheless, breaking his own rules, decided to take everything. He thought that if such treasures are lying around, then their owners will not be particularly upset if not missing some little thing, say, these Seriosha. This is a ring with a red stone. But this bracelet is also probably worth a lot of money. The boy took everything he liked in jewelry, to sell them to some fence and get good money for them. At least, that's what he thought and hoped, suppressing his remorse and carefully closing the bedroom door behind him. Jack headed for the exit and was already down the wide staircase back to the hall. But suddenly his attention was drawn to a painting hanging directly opposite a huge mirror in a gilded frame. It depicted a man in his forties. He was sitting in a wheelchair. His facial features were very well drawn. And suddenly this image reminded Jack something something very well. Familiar had curls, dimples on her cheeks, a straight nose, freckles, and most importantly eyes. They were different colors. One was Arius, the other green man. Jack couldn't help himself from loud astonishment and even whistled in amazement like fire. He took in the strange portrait. For from the canvas, his own face was looking at him, only more grown up. 
Jack, too, had eyes of different colors. Once in words, the left-handed doctor at the inspection had explained to him that such a defect, as he put it, was called temerity. It is a congenital peculiarity, he said. Then it very often accompanies various congenital genetic diseases. No wonder your parents rejected you. Who would want a freak like that? Little Jack then did not understand everything, but very offended that he was called a freak and cried in his crib at night for a long time. And now, when he saw the image of a man just like himself in that rich house right in front of him, he remembered everything. The boy looked at himself for a long time in the mirror, hanging opposite the picture, twisting this way and that, trying to take the same angle. It appeared that the man was indeed his exact copy, or rather Jack was a copy of the stranger. Hearing the sudden sharp sound of crashing glass, the boy froze in shock as he made an awkward move in front of the mirror and broke the vase next to it. Jack did not even have time to react. He was immediately seized with a terrible fear. But most of all, he was frightened by quick footsteps, which were heard somewhere on the first floor from the side of the service rooms. The boy immediately picked up a bag of groceries, gathered all the things he had grabbed and started to run. Hold it. A voice came from behind him. Jack did not turn around. He ran down the back stairs, reached the door through which he had snuck here, and tried to open it. Nothing worked, however. It was now locked. Jack held it a few more times and realized that nothing would work. The kid started looking for other ways to escape, and the footsteps were getting closer. Stand still. A man yelled behind him. He was about to catch up with the boy, but he jumped onto the wide windowsill, smashed the window with his shoulder, and jumped out of the building. The alarm in the house was so loud that the whole village seemed to hear it. The man ran to his booth to turn that awful one off, tired of the left-handed sound that was clearly disturbing all the neighbors. Meanwhile, Jack carried everything he could away from the place. He wanted to get away as fast as he could. After all, he'd seen movies where the police were on their way to pick up a criminal within minutes. After about 15 minutes, he was exhausted. Jack realized he had stopped right at some half-abandoned bridge over a frozen river. Nearby was a huge tank, which was intended for burning various country garbage. Jack took matches out of his pocket, and all in the same house, and tried to set fire to the contents of the tank. There were trash scraps, split boards, cut branches. Surprisingly, he succeeded. He spread the stolen slabs on the ground, felt the jewelry in his pocket with his hand, and opened a can of canned fish. This night promised to be a long one, and he really hoped the police weren't looking for him. How wrong was Jack? When did you notice he was missing? Questioned Kate the policeman in the morning, when they were missing one child. He had run away before, but came back in a few hours, answered the principal, pretending to be very upset. All this action took place in the hall of the first floor, this was seen by Maria, who was now everyday orphanage. The girl was very angry. There is no sympathy and sympathy in this woman. Maria still did not understand what was the plan of the Viper, why she is sitting here with this policeman, and not in her office, as usual, and winding snot on her fist, pretending to be a slender mother. She called the police for a reason. She doesn't care about the kids, probably pursuing another goal more selfishly but Maria couldn't yet figure out which one. Waking up the next day, Jack was happy to find himself in the same place where yesterday he fell asleep with his back to the warm and conditionally stove after the burning of garbage Baku. The police didn't find him, or maybe they weren't looking for him, but still the orphanage had to report him missing. So it's going to be harder to find the laborer now. Of course, the whole drug trafficking fable was a complete lie, just to fake it in front of Maria. Excuse me, do you need a waiter? Asked the boy to the administrator of the 10th or 15th cafe. The girl looked at him with an evaluating look, and then a wide smile appeared on her face. Hello, my savior, she said to him. Now, as I see, you are in need, Jack looked at her in surprise. And then he realized. Why did she seem vaguely familiar? You managed to get away from them after all. I'm glad, he smiled broadly and he smiled back at her. As you can see, I'm alive and well too. But I really need a job. I can work for half pay, he added, quickly fearing that he would be turned down. Wait here, she said, we'll figure something out. 
and she went into the back rooms. Jack really hoped she would return with good news, and that his prayers to the universe had been answered. Come with me. She invited him in, returning a few minutes later, and beckoned him with her hand. Here, Helen, this is the guy I told you about, she said, opening the office door and a pretty woman sitting behind the desk. What's your name? Asked it to the supervisor, Jack. Jack firmly answered the teenager. And middle name. The boy thought for a moment. He didn't have a real middle name. Since he had been raised in an orphanage since birth, he had never known his biological parents and didn't want to know. They had abandoned him, which meant they didn't want him to have a child. That's why he didn't want to have parents either. The woman looked at him suspiciously, but continued her questioning. How old are you? 16. Where do you go to school? Do you have any work experience? Jack hesitated. The manager obviously didn't need to know that he had escaped from an orphanage, was studying there as well, and the only work experience he had was cleaning an orphanage. Off and on, going to school, and you know it's mine, and work experience. I worked as a janitor and a box man for my uncle, an auto mechanic. The woman wrote something down with a pen on a document. But I can't officially employ you, but you can work part-time for us unofficially, the manager said after a while. Say thank you, Vasilisa. She's the one who did the training for you. Perfect for me, respectfully replied the boy. Your passport asked the woman. I hold out my hand. Jack looked at her anxiously and nervously. He didn't have a passport, or rather he had one, but only the principal had access to the records of the orphanage for such children. What Jack was running away deep into the night didn't even cross his mind. It is not there, nonchalantly answered Jack. You mean how? In complete amazement asked the woman. My father. My father doesn't want me to work, so he took away my passport and gives it to me only on special occasions, said the boy. The woman said puzzled and shook her head incredulously. Well, you will still work for us unofficially. At the same time, two whole weeks on probation. So you will bring as much as you can. I'll take your word for it. You sat down and said you're a good person and you won't let us down. Truly, Jack nodded silently. Come on, I'll show you around welcoming you, Vesalisa told him, waiting for the results of the interview near the office. That's how Jack found himself with both a job and a place to live. In the evening of the same day, one of the waiters offered him an apartment for two. Fairly reasoned that it would be less burdensome for two. And Jack settles in with his new companion Vasily. Meanwhile, in the rich house Jack had broken into. A couple days ago, a lot of things were happening. Andrew, I'm home shouting she's a fine woman. Her mink coat was covered with snow. It was snowing heavily, and the cab stopped farther away than it should have. The road had not yet been cleared. A butler came up to the mistress and removed her heavy burden behind Andrew, where he was carrying it. She ordered the servant. I'll call him in a moment. The butler answered courteously and left for the checkroom. The woman threw her gloves on, carelessly took off her shoes, and walked to the first floor sitting room. She allowed the maid to pour herself a glass of wine and waited for her guard. He had called at an odd hour yesterday and told a strange story about a vagrant breaking into the house and smashing a vase. He also went through the floors and stole some jewelry from a jewelry box in one of the bedrooms. It's a miserable loss. It didn't upset the landlady much. That jewelry box contained worthless costume jewelry. It had been brought into the guest bedroom once to please the little daughter of one of the hostess's friends. It was left there. But the very fact of the intrusion made Lisa very angry. She was determined to give her guards a tough showdown. Finally, Andrew, the eldest of the three security guards in this rich house, appeared and his inflamed eyes said that he had not slept at all thinking how to defend himself in this whole story to his mistress. Good evening, Lisa. Cautiously, he said hello. Come here, tell me what happened. Lisa said in a threatening tone. The guard began to tell her the details of the incident. He even mentioned what the boy was wearing, which he didn't say, but surprised the woman. What a memory you have. In a caustic tone, Lisa remarked. Where did you get such details? So embarrassed, Andrew. So I was just looking at the security cameras today. Okay, so they were working. Why the hell didn't you show them to me right away? 
Well, I thought you wanted to get the details of the story from me. What the hell details? I just want that brazen thief. Find him. We need to punish him so the others don't. And if you don't find him, you'll be saying goodbye to your well-paid security job. He didn't feel like it. In a small room with monitors, the guard pressed some keys and the screen showed an image. At first, nothing happened. The camera just filmed the black exit from the house. But after a minute, the monitor showed movement. The door fell away and a boy entered the house. His face was indistinguishable in the semi-darkness. Andrew switched the image, and now the video surveillance was from the second floor. It was clearly visible as the boy entered the guest bedroom, rummaged through the jewelry box, stuffed his loot into his pocket, walks out next. On the fast-forwarded view, it showed him walking down the stairs. At some point the landlady tensed up and ordered him to stop and draw away. The woman took a long look at the footage of the little thief, examining the painting and fidgeting in front of the mirror. Her breathing quickened. Her hands trembled, her face reddened and covered with vapor. Lisa, you're all right. Careful, Andrew asked. But it was as if the woman didn't hear him. Her eyes went black, she felt dizzy, and she passed out. She probably would have fallen off the chair she was sitting on. But Andrew caught her at the last moment. Hi, and Uncle David. Maria said hello, peering into the janitor's, and I really appreciate your concern. David replied sadly. Have you heard from Jack? No, sighed Maria. After Jack left, everything changed. It was as if life was no longer colorful. Every day brought terrible pain. The very next day after the escape, when everyone learned the details of his disappearance, the girls declared a real bullying. In the canteen, they spit in her food, pounced in the shower room, poured cold water on her. Once she was shoved into the boy's room in her underwear, the girl cried for a long time. She told her Uncle David, the only person she could tell everything to. There was no more support from tutors and teachers. Her grades were lowered, and she was held accountable for every little thing. She was humiliated in front of everyone. Maria suffered a lot during that couple weeks. She understood the bullying, the organized viper, she could do nothing about it. And there was no word from Jack. What about him? Where was he? She was so worried. Maria was already beginning to fear the worst, but she still hoped that Jack just hadn't found a way to contact her yet. The police continued their search, but it was pointless. There wasn't a single lead. And Maria, of course, remained silent. She would never break a promise. Several times she was summoned by the principal and threatened in various ways that she would be handed over to a mental institution, sent to a juvenile colony. But the girl was still silent. She believed in friendship and honestly, and in New Year's miracles. After all, somewhere they exist. In the meantime, he worked hard in the cafe, delivering orders, washing dishes. He was not used to scrubbing floors. Therefore, having once replaced the cleaning lady, he took over the job. The salary was paid once a week. The money was enough to eat and pay for the apartment, which they now rented for two. The rest of the money he saved in his spare time and traveled to dog shelters. But the dog was nowhere to be found. Jack did not despair and did not give up and continued to search. I finally got my mom a new coffee maker, Kevin said to his new friend in passing. He was already 20 years old and had been working at the cafe for almost a year. His mother lived in another neighborhood, but she visited her son often, and Kevin promised to introduce her to Jack someday. But so far Jack has only seen her in pictures. The beautiful woman works in a law firm. And her husband Jack was very jealous of his friend, because he had a full-fledged family. True, the husband of the mother came to Vasily not father, but stepfather. But this is completely unimportant. He was a good uncle, according to Vasily, and treated his stepson as his own son. Vasya's mother had some dark past, and until he was six years old, the boy was brought up at his grandmother's house. But then things got better. She took her son in. She married a second time and they had a normal, happy family. Kevin loved his mother and really wanted to please her at Christmas, so he went to work part-time in a cafe, along with going to law school. He rented an apartment to feel like an adult, independent of his parents. Jack understood that feeling. 
He'd experienced it himself, just like David the janitor. He was like a father to him. Of course, Jack did not tell Vasia that he lived in an orphanage and told all his new friends that he was saving up for a present for his favorite uncle. I need a search team here right away and get Kelly, ordered Lisa. As soon as she woke up in bed, the girl immediately ran to fulfill the order. Next to Lisa sat her guard and looked at her pitifully. Wouldn't it be better to call the police? Puzzled? Asked Andrew. No, she objected loudly. I don't want publicity. Otherwise everyone will think it's easy to get into my house. After all, my guard likes to take naps. Andrew turned away silently. He hated to hear such words from the lady of the manor, but she was right. He had failed in his job and now had no right to decide what to do. He's lost his chance to be a true confidant of the mistress. Tell me, what did you see? Did you get so scared and then you fainted? Careful, he asked Lisa. None of your business. The woman replied blankly, not taking her eyes off the door. She was waiting for Kelly, the estate manager. She was the person who knew why a common thief had caused such a violent reaction. Lisa finally had the door open and Kelly entered the room. Okay, Andrew, everyone, leaving us alone, ordered the landlady sharply. With a sigh, the guard stood up and left the room, but stayed at the door to overhear the two women's entertaining conversation. Oh, this is a terrible situation, said Lisa. That thief is Jack, you know Jack, marveled the manager of the horse son. Are you sure? Yes, I've already called all the agents. Lisa continued. He must be tracked down at all costs. He is a threat to my existence. There was silence in the room. And then footsteps were heard. The guard sent the door open and it swung open. Kelly gasped in fright. What are you doing here? She asked suspiciously. Checking the outlets. Andrew got out of it. The woman gave him a scornful look and left with loud clacking of her heels. Andrew went to his room to think about what he had heard. Apparently, this thief was familiar to them. His name was Jack, but this information gave Andrew nothing. So he decided to get to the truth, whatever it took. The first thing he did was to go to Kelly, who was in charge of the household and obviously knew more about the boy than anyone else. Hello, said the guard in a friendly voice as he looked into the housekeeper's room. She was sitting at the desk and frantically writing something down. What do you want? Said the woman, not taking her eyes off the paper. I wanted to ask you something, the man began. So ask, don't drag it out. In general, you know this thief, the guard carefully asked the question, closing the door behind him. The woman immediately pulled away from the documents and looked at him suspiciously. You don't know what you're getting into, Andrew. You better forget about him and you'll be fine. Kelly said sternly, I mean, this boy is unusual. He has some kind of meaning to the mistress. The woman stood up from the table. A mask of anger froze on her face. I warned you, she said threateningly. The guard raised his eyebrows well. But keep in mind, if you don't tell me everything you know, I'll tell your mistress where her diamond bracelet disappeared to. After all, it wasn't the maid who was scandalously fired a couple months ago. The man said with a smirk. You probably don't know this, but I made a copy of the video before you deleted it. Kelly immediately darkened and sat back in her chair. Okay, she muttered grudgingly, I feel like the truth is about to come out. I don't think she'll be able to keep this secret forever. What do you mean by that? Andrew asked with increasing interest. Kelly was silent for a few seconds, gathering her courage, but then she told the old story a character that seems to be coming together again on the pages of the story. It all started a long time ago. Our Lisa had a sibling named Robert. He was gravely ill in the last months of his life sitting in a wheelchair. I don't remember what kind of illness he had, but he died very young. He was about 27 years old at the time, I think. And eight months after he died, Jack was born. It turned out that one of the maids had gotten Robert pregnant and he died a month later, that's the trouble. Lissa was furious that her late brother had a bastard by the maids. She couldn't have that, so she kicked the girl out. But a few months later, just before Christmas, at this very time, 15 years ago, a basket with a baby in it was dropped at our gate, with a note saying, here's your nephew, call him Jack, and since I don't have the means to raise him, I'm putting him in your hands. 
oh, the mistress is angry again. After all, the wench named her brat Jack, probably to make her even angrier. She and Robert's father's name was Jack. She wouldn't change the baby's name for some reason, but she wouldn't keep it for herself. She gave it to the orphanage, of course. See if they'd adopt him. Looks like the poor kid either went to a bad family or he was never adopted at all. And the point is, Lisa has no right to this house and all this wealth. Her fathers will specify exactly that the estate goes to his son Alexei. And according to the rules, if he also had a son, he would subsequently be the heir. That's why Lisa barreled away from Jack's baby. Firstly, to avoid all the fuss, and secondly, to get the inheritance. But you can't just give a baby to an orphanage. They're overcrowded as it is. And you mean to say that a woman with a billion-dollar fortune came to them just like that, gave the child to them, and the whole case is closed, interrupted the guard. No, of course our Lisa is not that stupid. Otherwise, how would she have gotten this house? And all that wealth. And she paid the principal at the orphanage to keep their secret forever. So if Jack escaped from the orphanage, she must be terribly nervous. Her career hangs in the balance. I mean, if all this deception gets out, she's gonna get fired for sure. And I think she could even go to jail for grand bribery. How much she paid her, I don't know, but it was a lot, a lot. It took Andrew a long time to get the meaning of the story he just heard. He couldn't believe that the landlady, who seemed to him to be a decent woman, turned out to be a real criminal. Where does his mother Jack live? Suddenly the guard asked. You asked the question, Kelly said indignantly. I haven't heard from her since then. What was your name? I don't remember my first name, just my last name. I think Roberts repeated the man's name and headed for the room. I don't know what you're up to, Andrew. The manageress spoke warningly. But I feel that I can't prevent you from doing anything good. But I won't help you either. Mind you, I'm not burned out enough to lose my place yet. And I also want to warn you that Lisa is a really dangerous person, and so am I. I'm pretty sure her brother didn't die of natural causes. I had to tell someone. Make it you. And Lisa's last agents are already looking for that boy. Do you understand? The guard nodded and left the room. What he had just learned made a huge impression on him. He was determined to find the boy and himself. After all, it was not for nothing that he had served in the internal special forces for so many years. He had some people finding skills. Andrew went into his den and reviewed the security cameras again. It didn't help him at all. Then he went to a special website that he had access to because of an old friendship. Here it was possible to look up addresses and many other data of people by surname. Let's say there were over 200 Roberts living in their town. The search would have taken a long time if the guard hadn't gotten Kelly's help again. Look, I think the maid's name was Anna Blondie. Unfortunately, I can't find any pictures of her. She might have changed her last name. Mumbled the woman, peering into the room. The search was now narrowed down to 30 people. It was necessary to go through everyone and see who could more or less fit. The guard found two women who seemed suitable, writing down their addresses. He decided to go to them. The agent who arrived had just left the house, leaving Lisa alone with her problem. She didn't know what she should do now. Poison her brother. Seemed like a great idea at one time, and until that damn baby, now almost a grown-up guy, fell on her head. He ruined all her plans, First of all, it was about to be Christmas, which she had planned to spend in Thailand. But now those plans were gone, and secondly, her position in this house was now very precarious. The sudden arrival of her nephew was a threat to everything she'd spent so long building. It was unbearable. Lissa poured herself some more wine, and then in a fit of sudden rage Schwartz threw the bottle against the wall. The dark red liquid poured over the Venetian plaster an ugly stain spreading splatter on the wall. Shards scattered across the floor and the expensive carpet. Hello, are you Anna Roberts? Andrew asked as a woman in her 50s opened the door. She looked at him in amazement. Yes, I'm not sure, the woman replied. Your son Jack, do you remember if he was started by a man? Of course, it's my son who doesn't know what he wants. The man answered the woman perplexed. He is in big trouble now, and how in trouble, shouted the woman. 
he had an accident on that motorcycle after all. And I told him I always told him, oh, you'll get into trouble with that damn iron. Oh God. And the woman started to cry. Then Andrew himself did not realize what was happening. Excuse me, what kind of motorcycle your son is only 15 years old? What? The woman was indignant. My son is already 30 years old. How dare you scare me like that? I'm sorry, I think I made a mistake. Yeah, you almost gave me a heart attack. Andrew stepped away as the woman literally pounced on him with fists and then slammed the door in anger. This mistake was very unpleasant. Next time, he promised himself to be more careful with the words he spoke. He'll end up in court. Give all the mothers a heart attack. What good would that do? Good afternoon. You, Anna Roberts. The guard asked tiredly. Now he had to drive across town. Yes, I am. Who's bothering you? A young woman answered the door. Child services. Here's the story. You used to have a son named Jack. No, she said, surprised. But you didn't have a child 15 years ago. The man interrupted her. He already realized that this was not the Anna he was looking for. That woman had to be more than 40 years old, and this woman could be at most 30 years old. No, she wasn't. Why you? But she couldn't finish her sentence. Did you find my Jack? Suddenly a voice came from behind. Andrew turned around and saw another woman coming up the stairs. She had two bags of groceries in her hands. And who are you? Andrew wondered. I'm Anna Roberts, the woman declared. And this she pointed to the girl in the doorway. This is my friend. The man was invited to enter the house, and he immediately agreed. Why did you introduce yourself as Anna? The man asked the girl. So I was waiting for the master to fix the internet. Anna made a request for herself, went to the store. And then you came in. So I was confused. The man raised his eyebrows and nodded understandingly. So you, Andrew, are from the guardianship authorities? The real Anna asked excitedly, looking at the guest. Not exactly, the guard answered embarrassedly and told them everything he knew, as well as outlined his further plan of action. In that case, he finished. Your son is not going to be well, is he? Are you ready to help me? And you ask. I've been looking for him for so many years but I was told that he was given up for adoption long ago, taking God knows where what I need to do. I'm ready to go anywhere right now, she screamed in excitement. We need to find him right away and do it faster than Lisa's people will, the man said firmly. The first place they went was to the orphanage. It was the most logical place for the boy to return to. Kelly had given them the address of the orphanage where Andrew had been taken. Anna and Andrew went there, Buddy, we're looking for this boy right here. Maybe you know someone like that. Andrew asked the guard, holding out a photo of Jack. It was a screenshot from the surveillance cameras. The guard scrutinized the photo and said, We have a Jack named Jack. How could you not know? He runs away from here every now and then. Now he's on the run, and they still can't find him. Do you have any information about him? Then you'll have to see the director. A couple looks good. Maybe, said the woman. Where's your director? I'll call the front desk. Come in, came a voice from behind the door. Andrew and Anna followed the direction of the well-pitched voice. Kate received them with a completely stony expression, although she had already been told the reason for the visit. Go ahead. Anna immediately became agitated. I've come for my son. His name is Jack. That's what they told us here, she exclaimed. Although she and Andrew had agreed not to reveal all the details at once. Why should I upset you? The Viper replied nonchalantly. This boy has been missing for weeks. He will probably be declared dead soon. Anna looked at Andrew in despair. Her eyes seemed to be screaming at her. That he was telling the truth. Nothing of the sort. He said confidently, turning to the principal. He's alive and recently CTTV cameras caught him at a suburban estate in an estate. Viper interjected with some surprise. Never mind, muttered Andrew, realizing he'd said too much. So you don't have any information. Is that right? The woman looked at him suspiciously, and then a faintly evil grin appeared on her face. No, I don't, Kate replied as convincingly as possible. Then the man silently stood up and walked toward the exit. Anna followed him, 
The principal did not try to stop them. She did, however, call the right place. Lissa asked Viper into the receiver, there was a sigh, and then a tired voice said what do you want? Who gave you this number? It's Kate. Kate, the director of the shelter, I'm sure you remember me. I have something I'd like to tell you that's not particularly pleasant. The thing is, Jack is missing. Really? Lisa said ironically. You knew, we've been looking for him for a long time. And with you I will have a separate conversation, if my memory serves me correctly. Many years ago you and I understood each other well. How could you miss him? And why is he still at the orphanage? Should you have gotten rid of him a long time ago? There's a lot of reasons, but that's not why I'm calling you. I wanted to warn you that a couple just came by the shelter looking for him. They're determined. I've pulled in all my services. We're looking for him and we will find him. Pray no one finds out. Lissa whispered angrily and hung up the phone. Kate listened to the short and annoying beeps and bit her lip nervously. Where can we find him? Anna cried. As she and Andrew walked down the stairs, leaving the shelter? Calm down, we'll find your Jack. Andrew reassured her as he opened the door. Suddenly some girl called out to them. Jack. Maria asked loudly, stopping shoveling snow. She just couldn't help herself. Andrew turned to wrinkle his forehead and looked at her questioningly. He and Anna looked at each other and approached the girl. Hi. Do you know something about Jack? Asked Andrew. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. Who are you? We're his friends too, believe me. Anna answered her. Maria looked long and distrustful at the woman's face and finally nodded. I believe you, you are kind. He recently gave me a letter. What letter? Can you give it to us? Anna asked quickly and looked at the girl with great hope. There were tears in her eyes. I had to burn it so Jack wouldn't get caught. Barely audible, Maria spoke. What was in that letter? Who could hurt him? He's afraid of someone. He's been threatened. Where is he now? Anna just bombarded Maria with questions. And Maria told them everything that had happened. Why did Jack run away and where could he be found? She just didn't have the energy to keep quiet and keep it to herself. And these people, they were obviously very interested in him. She believed them. The bastards had a sixth sense that their intentions for Jack were good. So now he works in this cafe, Andrew clarified. When Maria finished her story, the girl nodded affirmatively. Thank you, sweetie. Anna stroked her cheek affectionately. I will never forget what you did for my son for my son. Maria marveled. You? Yes, I am his mother. Anna nodded affirmatively biting her lip to keep from crying right here, in the courtyard of this terrible place. Please don't tell anyone as long as you promise. Of course, Maria stared at her mesmerized. I know you'll find him, you're sure to find him. When the two adults left, Maria stood still for a long time, looking after them in tears. Joyful hopes flowed and flowed down her cheeks, heated with excitement. And she didn't even think of freezing. So at this address, we have a Cafe Caribbean, muttered Andrew sitting down in the car and looking at the navigator from here to the place 46 minutes Caribbean. Anna marveled, but that's where my son works. Well, of course, Andrew looked anxiously at the woman. The girl told us so. You don't understand. Anna shook her head. Another son. Before Jack was born, I already had a child. I was married and had a boy. He's 20 now so he works at the same place as Jack now. Oh my God. Andrew rolled his eyes. This story was getting bigger and bigger by the hour. Hello. The girl behind the bar smiled friendly at the new customers. Come in, sit down. The waiter will come to you now. Thank you. But that's not why we're here. No, no, we don't need coffee. Thank you. We're looking for a Jack, a 15-year-old boy we were told works here. I'll check it out. The barista smiled radiantly and ducked into Helen's back room. Jack is being asked by what look like very serious people. That's the last thing we need, the manager worried. He's not on our payroll. Maybe it's some kind of inspection. Tell them they've made a mistake. I'll call him now and tell him not to come in today. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for waiting. Still smiling, Kate reappeared. The strangers waited patiently. Unfortunately, 
We don't have any employees with that name. You must have been misinformed. I'm sorry. Jack leisurely staggered down the street. Today he had been given an unexpected day off. Some kind of inspection came to the cafe, and all the freelancers were sent home. Something to do with the IRS. It's a shame to lose his income. But it freed up time to look for Doggy. The boy never gave up hope of finding his terrible friend. But now it was quite late, and the run was fruitless. Half a city disappointed Jack approached his entrance, as suddenly a huge man stood in his way. He looked like a real giant. Didn't it seem to you that he was about two and a half meters tall? He was wearing a black suit, black shirt, and dark glasses. He looked very imposing with his arms folded across his chest. Did the man have a bass voice? Asked Jack. The boy was so frightened that he nodded. He sensed the danger in his gut, but the big man caught up with him in two jumps, threw him on the ground and twisted his arms from behind. It down. From there, everything unfolded as if in a dense night gloom. A sharp stabbing pain in his shoulder and he was being dragged somewhere. A slam, car doors, darkness. The car stopped right in front of the house where Kevin was renting the apartment and Jack with him. Anna jumped out of the car and ran to the entrance. Andrew followed her. Kevin had spotted them from inside, glancing outside the first floor window. Mom, he looked at her questioningly as he opened the door. What are you doing here? Did something happen? The look on his mother's face startled him. Jack's son, answer me, please. There's a boy named Jack who works with you. I think he just got a job at your cafe. How do you know Jack? The son was becoming more and more surprised at what was happening. Just answer me, please. Andrew said there's no time to explain who I am and what this has to do with your mother. The boy stared at this man he didn't know with bewilderment, but still said, yes, of course I know Jack. He lives with me. I told you last week, mom, I found a roommate. Oh my God. Anna cried out and slapped herself on the forehead with all her might. Mom, Kevin marveled. What's the matter with you, son? Son, I'll explain everything to you later. Take care of yourself. She spoke quickly. She smacked, kicked him in the cheek, and literally ran out of the entrance. Behind her came out and stranger man, tentatively patted him on the shoulder in a friendly manner. Not understanding anything, the guy shrugged, closed the door, and returned to his computer. Here are my guests, Lisa said with a wicked irony. When Anna and Andrew came inside, and I was so looking forward to seeing you. Did you really hope to find the boy faster than me? Why don't you say something? My loyal guard. There's nothing you want to tell me. Andrew realized she already knew everything. I guess Kelly didn't hide it after all and shot the story down. Or was she forced to tell it? More likely the second, where the boy sternly asked Andrew, if I were you, I wouldn't expect to get away with something like that. Well, you're not in my shoes yet, Lisa laughed and threw it. It looked like she was very drunk. And the boy is gone in a mocking tone, Lisa added. And vaporized. And was there a boy? And where did you put my son, the bastard? Anna exclaimed. There was no limit to her anger. This woman had ruined her whole life, thrown her out on the street when she most needed shelter and work. Then she took away my son. She trampled all over everything. Lissa's face had changed. Now she was not smiling, but only looking at Anna contemptuously and angrily. How dare you call me that in my house? The owner of the mansion was indignant. And then something happened that no one expected. Anna lashed out at Lisa. Both women clashed and fell to the floor. Anna clawed at her dungeon like a cat and began to tear the hair from her head. Lisa fought back and yelled and screamed with her free legs. Andrew rushed to break them up. He got caught up in the heat of the battle, where my son was hysterically screaming at Anna. Finally, running away at the commotion the stewards helped Andrew melt down, grabbing all the women. Anna collapsed into a chair, clasping her hand and drumming her cheek. Lissa, breathing heavily, sat on the floor near the fireplace. You're not going to get away with this. Anna finally broke the tense silence. Do you really think you can stand up to me? Lisa smirked. I'm not going to let you ruin my life. Everything was fine until you slut showed up here. How dare you seduce my brother? 
we loved each other, cried Anna. Of course, she realized that it was better not to show weakness in front of this terrible woman. But her emotions were running high. He was your own brother. How could you? It's not my fault I was born a woman. My daddy bequeathed everything to him, not me. He take the whole inheritance and I get a pittance. I had to secure my future. I loved him too. I had a hard time making that choice once too. I'm not a killer, but I had to kill him. I had to, you know? It was his own fault. He got together with the servants, had a baby from some crush. So you killed him. Andrew came forward. How did you do it? It was easy. Lissa laughed. The liquor had loosened her tongue. I put rat poison in his food for a long time and very carefully, just a little bit at a time. She declared triumphantly, as if she were telling me about her merits. He's always had poor health. No one noticed anything. Even the doctor who wrote out the death certificate for this baby, she wrinkled her nose like a toothache. Did you win him from me? Anna jumped up from her chair again. Her eyes glittered furiously. How dare you take my baby away from me? I didn't put anyone out, Lissa resented. You dropped him off right on my porch yourself. That she opened her mouth in indignation, but could say nothing. And only silently, like a fish thrown on land with a noise, sucked in air in an empty attempt to breathe. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Suddenly there was a strange, commanding male voice. It sounded so out of place in this house that everyone in the room flinched in surprise. Everyone except Andrew remained in their seats. The new phrase added to the sound, and the owner himself lord of other phrases. A man in a police uniform entered the room stomping the boots of the clean carpets, followed by two others. This is a detention. The man entered in a casual tone and announced that Lisa Lisovskaya was a citizen. You are detained on suspicion of premeditated murder. The silent scene, which lasted after these words for two or three minutes, ended this eventful evening. Then everyone started to talk animatedly, and some of them shouted and threatened. But this does not concern the point of our narrative at all. Jack was sitting on the bed, wrapped in a straitjacket. He wanted to cry more than anything else in the world. He had already tried everything bursting out, biting, running, and openly breaking a window or secretly finding some loophole. But alas, there was no escape. New Year's Eve was only two days away, and it looked like he was going to spend the holiday in a real asylum. When he was brought back to the orphanage, they wouldn't even let him talk to any of his friends. They put him in the basement like they always do. They took him out after a few hours and brought him here. This is where they sedated him. They tied him to the bed for any untimely word, tied him to the bed for trying to escape, gave him some shots that gave him a terrible headache, and he didn't care about anything at all. Sometimes it seemed to Jack that he had already died and gone straight to hell. But for what? When Lisa was taken away, Andrew again used his longtime connections, which they used to find her very quickly. Where was Jack taken? In the emergency room of the asylum where he had left Anna, who had absolutely nothing to do in the ward stank horribly of the box. Turning around, he saw her face. It was completely white and seemed to blend in with the walls. No, the walls were dirty, but there was no blood on Anna's face. Excuse me, who are you? Jack asked when he opened his eyes and saw a strange woman sitting on a chair in the headboard next to his bed. I guess he said it too quietly. She hadn't heard him. Looking closer, Jack realized she was asleep, sitting in an uncomfortable, awkward position. Either those pills they'd given him had taken a toll on his physical and mental state, or he was asleep too. But he felt as if he'd seen her somewhere before in some distant, beautiful dream. Jack smiled at his dreamy memory and closed his eyes again. When he woke up the next time, she was there too, and again, and again. Well, the stern doctor once again scrutinized Jack carefully. I think the patient can be discharged, but only under your responsibility, he said to Anna. After the holidays, you will definitely come back. We will need to do the examination again to take blood, and we will definitely come. The doctor interrupted him by a man of sturdy build standing next to him. What questions? But suddenly said Jack, but I don't know you at all, where you are going to take me. Nowhere without your wish, the man smiled at him. 
but I think someone will be able to help us. Jack tensed up, waiting for more blows of fate. These people were quite nice. They didn't yell, didn't drug him, and generally treated him well. Who knows? And he had gotten used to the fact that he couldn't trust anyone. In addition, he was told some fairy tale about how he would have a real family and a house of his own or something like that. He couldn't remember things very well now. Everything was a blur. Jack, a girl of about 14 years old, came into the room and approached his bed. Jack, do you remember me? She asked him hopefully. Do you really remember me, Maria? The boy smiled. You, Maria? That's right. She laughed and cried at the same time. You recognized me, you recognized me. Jack, will you please listen to me? Nothing bad will ever happen to you again. You hear me? It's over. Our viper's in jail. Can you believe it? We have a new principal now, such a nice woman. She put up a Christmas tree in the lobby. Can you imagine a real Christmas tree? That's great. Jack marveled, smiling weakly. I must be dreaming, decided the boy, and I'm dreaming. I don't want to wake up. I don't want to wake up. Maria kept talking and talking and counting, like a happy little bird. I think she said he should go away with these nice people. Well, since Maria said so. He woke up again this time a different bed, not a hospital bed this time. It was so, so strange around, cozy or something. Where was he? Not in an orphanage, and certainly not in a mental institution. Jack lay there for a while with his eyes open. Looked around. The room was furnished like people who live in their own homes. Curtains on the windows, flowers, soft carpet, a rack of books, a desk, a computer. Stop. What's that sound? He carefully lowered his legs out of bed. His head didn't seem to be dizzy anymore. Tried to stand up leaning against the walls. Waddled to the door. Strange. It's not even locked, Maximov. It sounded again even closer. And a small brown dog with big funny ears rushed into the room, wagging his whole body. We were thrilled. He rushed to Jack, started petting, hopping on his hind legs, trying to jump up to his friend's face. Donut trembling voice said Jack Donut. Is it really you? The dog confirmed and hastily sat down on his hind legs. And the front ones made a bunny. My little one. Jack shouted out of joy and picked up the little dog in his arms and held him tightly to himself. And he finally licked the salt water of the sacred cheeks with his soft pink tongue. Jack, are you awake? A smiling woman came into the room, the same woman who had been with him in the hospital. How are you feeling? Sort of okay, the boy answered confused and tried to remember who she was. Why is she here? Why is he here? When you get dressed, let's go downstairs. Everyone is already gathered and waiting for you to wake up. This new cryptic phrase confused Jack again. He still didn't understand anything. Don't worry, everything will be all right. The woman told him and looked so affectionate that he immediately believed her. Besides, now he had his donut again. She walked out, and Jack even forgot to ask her where his dog had come from. Maybe he did die, and now he's finally going to heaven. Is this woman a real angel? That would be nice. Downstairs, where he went down the stairs with her help, there were so many people. It made his eyes water. He saw Uncle David and smiled happily at him. Maria was sitting next to him. She immediately ran up and hugged him tightly and even cried a little. Then there was this tall jock who also came to the hospital and Kevin. Where did you come from here? Jack asked him in surprise. And I wanted to add, did you die too? But that would have been a bit off, so we kept silent. Kevin laughed and said that he would find out soon. Then everyone started talking. The tall jock first. He told how he had overheard his landlady talking to her manager and realized that the selection had infiltrated the house not just a street vagrant, realized, and he was horrified. How cruel could people be? Something turned over in his soul and he decided to help this boy and his mother. Jack listened attentively, but he didn't understand everything. However, he remembered that he had really been in some rich house and a mirror and a broken vase. There was a portrait. Suddenly he said aloud and became embarrassed. Everyone looked at him, right? The tall man said carefully. You remembered it well. 
You look a lot like me, Jack said and smiled embarrassedly. This portrait was of your father. The pretty woman came closer and inquisitive, looked into his eyes. Do you understand? Yes, nodded Jack. He didn't really believe this information, but he had to be polite. They're all so worried. And me. I'm your mom, the woman said even more quietly and wept. Jack's son. Mama, he looked at her, even startled. Mama. Yeah, yeah. She put her arms around him and pressed her cheek firmly against his cheek. My son. We were separated a long time ago when you were born. By bad and very bad people. But it's all right now. You hear me? Everything's gonna be all right. I found you, Jack. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Kevin came over and patted Jack on the shoulder. Hey, stop hugging. Kevin reproachfully said Anna and released Jack from her embrace. It turns out that we are brothers, reported Kevin dumbfounded young Jack. That's it. Jack could not answer anything and only shook his head. You'll get used to it. Kevin laughed and clapped him on the shoulder again. Jack was approached by Maria again. Congratulations. Now you have a real family. Mash in the received lump in the throat, carefully said Jack. And who are you? Probably my sister. No, laughed the girl. But in her laughter clearly heard shades of bitterness. I'm just your friend, just like before. Only you won't be living in an orphanage now. You got a mom, can you believe it? And it's Christmas. And everything is so wonderful. Oh Jack, you're so lucky. I'm so happy for you. You are, aren't you? The faithful donut came running up and tailed me. He barked happily and sat down next to Jack, expressing complete doggy happiness. I finally have an owner, Uncle David. Jack looked for his older friend. And you. I haven't changed a bit either, the janitor smiled. I hope you haven't changed either. Now that I've become such a happy and rich young man. I'm rich. Jack marveled. And suddenly he laughed at the top of his voice. I understood through the laughter, he said. You're just kidding me. Nobody's kidding you. Andrew came over and put a heavy hand on his shoulder. You're having a hard time because you've been drugged up to your eyeballs with all that crap in the asylum. That's why your head's doing all those crazy things. But you're almost well enough to get over it. The rest will be your mother, your family, and your new home. And yes, you're a pretty wealthy young man now. Your friend is right. In fact, you'll be rich soon. I just have to get the proper paperwork. Don't worry. Vanya, Kevin is back in the conversation. Later you go, and today we'll celebrate Christmas and have fun. Okay, Jack nodded. Really, he wouldn't think about the whole story now. He wouldn't. He'd think about it some other time. But tell me, he turned to Uncle David again. How the donut turned up. Maria and I were looking for it while you were in the hospital. David. While you were lying in hospitals, we couldn't find it. You know where? At the circus. Completely by accident. We went to every shelter in town. When they fired our viper, they assigned another director to us. You can live under her, you know? Maria even lets me go into town with her on my own responsibility. You write an application and go ahead. The main thing is that one of the adults must vouch for you, but you don't have to avoid it. David squinted slyly, although some people have benefited from it. This Christmas Jack went to bed very early, uncharacteristically early. But then he didn't regret it, because when he woke up the next morning, he finally realized that he wasn't dreaming. He actually now had a home, a family, and a mom. He spent the next few days getting to know his new relatives, and they explained and told him over and over again this amazing, almost miraculous story. Finally, he began to understand something. So Kevin, too, had been born Adam before me. He asked Anna over afternoon tea. Of course, you were born before you, brother. His older brother laughed, shoving him in the side. And quite sensitively smiling in the whole mouth donut. Sat under the table and sometimes touched his cold, wet nose in the bathroom foot. Yes, dear answered the patient mother for the umpteenth time ignoring her eldest son's grimaces. I was married to Jack's father at the time, but then we divorced. He turned out to be a very bad man, and I was left destitute with a small child in my arms. I had to take a job as a maid in a rich house. I'll leave Jack with Grandma for now. 
By the way, she's coming tomorrow, so you can finally meet her. So in that house you were so lucky to get into recently, I met your father. We fell in love, but he had been in very poor health since childhood. And his sister Lisa took advantage of that. She poisoned him, putting poison in his food month after month. He got weaker and weaker. Soon he couldn't move on his own. I urged him to see a doctor, but he wouldn't. But he only smiled sadly and said that he was ready for everything long ago. I was desperate. When he died, I thought I was going to die too. But then I realized I was pregnant. When Lisa found out, she threw me out of the house without regret and didn't even pay me for the last months of work. And when you were born, I was so weak. The labor was very hard. Then the doctors came and the investigator with them. And they told me that my baby was missing. I almost died of horror again and immediately guessed who could have done such a thing. But it was impossible to prove anything. Lissa was to me a simple woman with no money and no connections, completely unattainable. But she wasn't the one who stole you, said Andrew, sitting at the table with the happy family, but her manager Kelly. The thing is, Kelly was once a close friend of Lisa's. She knew that she had a tendency to alcoholism and knew something else. Namely that her friend and part-time hostess would never have children of her own. She hoped to induce her to write a will in her favor. And it must be said, she succeeded in doing so. But that was when you, the newborn son of the rightful heir, stood in her way. She couldn't let your fate remain unknown. She didn't dare to kill a child, but she paid someone to steal you from the maternity hospital and drop you off at Lisa's house, hoping that she would not be afraid of such an abomination. But Lissa didn't want to take any unnecessary heat either. To Kelly's disappointment, she sent you straight to the orphanage, arranged with the principal to get you adopted and out of town. But why didn't anyone ever adopt me? Jack wondered. Didn't anyone want me with my different eyes? They say it's a genetic disorder. Who told you such nonsense? Anna clutched her head. You weren't adopted because your viper wanted to have you close to her so she could blackmail Lisa on occasion. And if she died, to mess with your head with all sorts of tales and get her inheritance, she'd find a way to take it away from you afterward. And that's for sure. Jack's face darkened and at the memory of his former principal. Let's not talk about sad things. Maria sitting immediately put her arm around the boy's shoulders. Everything has long been behind us. What kind of a fool am I? Suddenly slapped himself on the forehead, Jack. I'd forgotten. Oh, Kevin, Kevin, you saved my money. I'm still asking. Ironic indignation from his brother. Here they are. He went out into the hallway, took out his wallet from his jacket pocket, and handed Jack some bills. I really wanted to buy David a coat as a Christmas present, Jack explained embarrassedly, but I was too late. Christmas had already passed. It's okay, Andrew reassured him. There's still Christmas to come. What's not to celebrate? And indeed, on 25th December, the big happy family welcomed guests again. This time at the head of the table sat the owner of the house, Anna's husband, a well-known lawyer in the city. In the midst of the events described above, he was away, but then actively involved in the story with his wife's youngest son. It was his professional assistance plus Andrew's invaluable connections that decided the outcome of this complicated case. Uncle David, embarrassed, began Jack, when all his friends and family were once again seated at one large table. You've been like a father to me all these years. Without you, I wouldn't have survived in that orphanage. I'm very grateful to you. Really, because I ran away that last time to earn money to buy myself a coat for Christmas. And I did. Here, take it, please, without refusing and please. The guy handed his friend a weighty and gift box. This is very important to me. Thanks, buddy. Thrilled, David said. And I wouldn't have survived without you either. Now let's have a toast. With shining eyes and said Anna. To friendship. After all, it was the friendship of good, real people that helped you and me to find each other again. And another one I also know what gift I want for this Christmas. At these words of his mother, Jack, all tensed up, squeezed his head into his shoulders. He suddenly realized that he had no gift for her and he had just given David expensive coats. That's what you call a son. But Anna did not even look at him at that moment. She looked at Maria. I think you can help me with that too, Maria. 
I'm a confused girl, as you can see recently, looking at you Jack, I realized what I'm missing for complete happiness. And what's interested? Asked Maria. Daughter say dear, do you want to be my daughter? From excitement, the girl could not utter another word. Tears of delight came to her eyes. Jack said it all for her, mom. He threw himself on his mother's neck and hugged her tightly. Thank you, mom. This is the best Christmas present for me too. That's how the Christmas story came out in one of the most ordinary towns with the most ordinary people who know how to value friendship, their family, and always try to do the right thing.